Okay, so let's get into Stoic um, logic and physics, but before we get into the ideas, just a brief uh, timeline about the scale of Stoicism and the developments that happen within Stoicism. So, you know, it starts before 300 BC, the founding of the school by Zeno of Citium, but then it develops over the next 500 years or so, and in the last couple of weeks of the class, we're going to be focused on writings by a Roman Stoic named Seneca, and several of you wrote scholar assignments about <clears throat> a book, I think by Pierre Hadot, on the inner citadel about Marcus Aurelius, a very late Stoic. Uh, so most of the ideas that we read about in uh, uh, for today on Stoic logic and physics was describing Greek Stoic theories, so closer to this end. Uh, and we think of Stoicism as being one systematic philosophy, that there's some, there's some way to say you know, what every true statement within the system is, and so forth, and what all it's committed to. But in fact, there are developments, of course, in the school over time. Different interests responding to different needs, different crises, different kinds of students, different languages. Writing in Latin causes a lot of problems for translating you know, Greek had been developing a sophisticated scientific language over 500 or 1,000 years earlier. La uh, writers in Latin had none of that, nothing of it, and had to take it all over from the Greeks. And so this is a big uh, period of transition and translation and transformation, in a way, of uh, Stoicism into these later um, Schools. So we have, to, we have to keep in mind the development. And there used to be a tendency to talk about early Stoicism and then sort of middle Stoicism with Posidonius and then you know, late Stoicism with these Roman figures like Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. Um, that way of talking and that periodization has fallen out of favor because it isn't really possible to draw very bright lines here and these weren't categories that the actors themselves Used. They thought they were just doing Stoicism, not late Stoicism or something like that. Um, and so there is a sense, again, in which it's a, a unified philosophy. In fact, so unified that though they recognize the traditional tripartite division of philosophy into logic, physics, and ethics, they develop these various kind of analogies um, to the way that these parts are interactive, interdependent, um, and cohesive. So they compare philosophy to an organism whose bones and sinews are logic, whose soul is physics, and whose flesh and muscle is ethics. Now, I'm not sure what exactly all that means or how that's supposed to be interpreted or, interpreted or understood. Actually, since, since Michael, since you are working on the idea of systematicity in philosophy, it occurred to me that it might be a good idea for you to look into what exactly the Stoics are doing with these images of highly unified philosophy. Whatever it means and whatever the significance of these different parts related to these different parts, the idea is that there's an organic unity of it, that the organism, as it were, can't exist or subsist without all of the parts interacting well together. And so they also have an even more bizarre image of an egg, which is a sort of proto-organistic um, analogy where logic is the shell, physics is the yolk, and ethics is the white part surrounding uh, the yolk. Um, and one would have to get into and figure out what their views about embryology and so forth were as a matter of biology and physics, I think, in order to unpack that. Uh, analogy. And then a bit more homely of a comparison to a garden where logic is the walls you have around the garden, physics are the fields or the flower beds, and then ethics is the fruit or produce that comes out of this. Now again, not sure what these images are supposed to convey, but the only point I need to make with them now is them stressing the tight unity and interdependence of all of these 
uh, parts of philosophy, and also the fact that they can be distinguished into parts. We, could, we really can analyze an egg into those three different parts, but at the same time, it's all part of one entity, one um, being. Now, one thing interesting about Stoics, and this has to do with the development of the school over a long period of time, is that Stoics had different conceptions about the order in which the parts of philosophy should be taught. So some of the early people, the founder, Zeno, and Chrysippus, the most important developer of Stoicism as a systematic scientific philosophy, Chrysippus, thought that the proper order was to study logic first, then physics, then ethics. Perhaps the idea being, if you can't reason, because you haven't studied logic, how are you going to reason about physics or ethics? And so we need to get certain preliminaries about reasoning out of the way before we can move on to these other subjects. But Diogenes of Ptolemaeus had a pretty good argument in saying, look, look, we've got to do ethics first, because we can't even let these people out on the street until we give them some ethics, right? You don't even want to know if you should teach them this, this other stuff about logic. Don't teach somebody nuclear physics until you know that they're a good person, right? So you need to do ethics first. But Apollodorus, and then Cleanthes gives a more detailed version of this, says that the order is logic, ethics, and then physics. After all, again, we need people to be able to um, reason, and we need them to be ethical people, um, but then eventually they need to learn the physics that is basic to all this. And the clean these arrangement is just an expansion of that topic. Study dialectic first, and then rhetoric, those are both kinds of logic. Then study ethics and politics, which are both parts of ethics and then study physics and theology, which are parts of physics. Now, the um, sort of middle period Stoic named Posidonius proposed the order physics, logic, and ethics, and this is a standard way of teaching the system of Stoicism, and it's the one that I'll follow today because most of our sources follow that order. Yeah, question. Is a, is a teaching order um, supposed to insinuate that Physics, say for Zeno, that physics is dependent on logic and then ethics is depend dependent on physics, or is it just simply maybe easier to teach in this order? Well, I interpret these as literally being a pedagogical order in which a, a, a student comes to grasp the system and not, um, not anything about its importance, because if we ask about its importance, that's like asking whether the tree or the fruit is important, or whether the bones or muscles are important. They're all important, and the organism doesn't function without it. So this isn't, this isn't um, an idea that Zeno and Chrysippus didn't think much of ethics. In fact, if you wanted to, you could think of it as everything's preliminary leading up to the real thing, which is ethics. Um, despite the way I was characterizing, oh no, we've got to teach them this uh, first. It could be that it's, that it's building up to the, to the real point of it, okay? So this isn't about the importance. This is a, a trying to work out a theory of what order do we teach people things in, something we're still concerned about. Now into every subfield, so we have curricular theories which are reflected in the order of course requirements that you have to take in a Field. And so we have very early logic requirements in the philosophy department. You know, this is, this is why Rick Grush's day is consumed with teaching Phil Penn, because we have a sort of Chrysippan um, concept to this. And we don't, we, don't, we don't give you access to David Brink until the very end when we're doing ethics or something. Um, no, not really. But there, there is a question about this. Which order does it make sense? to teach it in. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it in the, the Posidonian um, order. So let's talk about Stoic physics first. Now, way, the way I'll introduce this is just giving you the way that they set up divisions of the field of ethics into different topics. So this isn't really giving you content of their physics, it's just showing you how they divide the topic of physics. Now, what, is, what does physics mean again? My favorite question to stump people with means nature, okay? So this is how we divide the study of nature. 
Okay? First division is the cosmos. Okay? The world. The universe. Okay? And this essentially has two parts. Mathematical astronomy, on the one hand, which is an extremely um, pre precise, accurate discipline even by this point. In fact, they develop analog computers and so forth at this point, as I'll show you on another slide. Um, another part of it is natural history, just the reasoning about what the size, shape, composition, origin, um, whether it's living or not, whether it's destructible or not, whether it's governed by God and providence and so forth or not, the sort of description, qualitative description of the nature of the cosmos as opposed to the quantitative description of it in the previous category. Which, by mathematical astronomy, we also probably mean to include meteorology, so accounting for things like rainbows um, and earthquakes, clouds, winds, rains, etc. Um, even though those, we don't usually put those under astronomy, astro-meteorology. Um, now, another aspect of physics is the theory of causal explanation. What things cause, if you want to know anything about physics, you need to begin to concentrate on the problem of what things cause other things. And again, we have a sort of mathematical and qualitative division. Mathematical causal explanations, we develop theories for in optics, harmonics, um, mechanics, uh, fields like that. Um, and then we also have a theory of the psychology of explanation. So what satisfies us as an explanation of a given phenomenon? What kind of causes of things do we think we need to grasp or apprehend in order to say that we know or understand something? And then the third division into the principles and elements. And there are two, essentially, principles of Stoic physics. The first is an active principle, which is identical with God, and a bunch of other stuff, as I'll explain uh, in a moment, and a passive principle, which is essentially identified with matter. And so the basic picture is that what really exists out there is a vast amount of otherwise unstructured, unqualified matter, and then a kind of um, God-like mind or reason that imposes order and form on that unqualified matter. And when we look out at the cosmos, that's what we're seeing, is a rationally organized continuum of matter that includes different kinds of beings that we can distinguish, for example, inanimate beings, plants, animals, <coughs> humans, also um, uh, the heavenly objects like sun, moon, stars, planets, how all of those move and so forth, all of that seems to bear out the idea that there is some active, rational principle which is ordering um, lifeless, inert, passive uh, matter. Now, here's another way to divide Stoic physics, or rather an order in which to teach it, begin with the relatively straightforward idea of bodies, things that are generated and destroyed, that we're familiar with on all sorts of levels. This includes furniture, computers, people, animals, plants, and so forth. In fact, everything is a body, according to this system. So in a way, we think of Stoicism as actually being a kind of materialist system like Epicureans, because they think that only bodies are real. Except there are some non-bodily things that are real in virtue of their relationship to bodies, and this includes time, place, void, and what I'm translating is language, but is actually would be more literally translated as sayable things or lepta, which I will get to when we get to uh, discuss Stoic logic. Okay, then again, we could teach about the principles. Unlike bodies, principles are ungenerated and indestructible, and these are of two kinds. The passive kind, unqualified substance, pure material body, and on the other hand, an active principle, reason, 
fundamentally reason or um, in Greek logos, but this is equivalent to cosmos, God, reason, mind, fate, even Zeus. So the active principle that organizes all this passive inert material stuff, it is rationally organized, and you can think of it if you want as being rationally organized by Zeus, or if you don't like the name Zeus, you can call it God, or whatever your preferred term is, call it the mind, or um, you could even call it fate. Um, but all of those are identical equivalent notions, and, uh, and they constitute the active uh, principle. Then they proceed to a discussion of the elements, earth, air, water, and fire, which are bodies that, out of which the other kinds of bodies, like plants, animals, and humans, are made out of, and into which they resolve or are dissolved upon uh, death. Then there's a more intense discussion of God, how, as identical to reason, God actively organized the cosmos in the best possible way. Is it like a designer or craftsman? Um, how, what kinds of, if, if so, what kinds of tools and what kinds of materials are used? and what kinds of blueprints and plans, and so on. Yeah? Is there a particular difference between God in this context and God in the uh, act of Whoops. No, not really. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is just an order in which you would, you would comprehend these various um, topics. OK, so it's not. Um, it's not that there is, there is another god, a kind of anthropomorphic god, in addition to this active principle that's identical with reason and uh, fate and so forth. Um, that's the only um, that, that, that's the only truly sort of divine um, entity here is reason itself and the fact that this matter is organized in some rational way. Meaning, first of all, that it's ra rationally comprehensible. I can figure out how this thing is composed out of earth, air, water, and fire. But second of all, that it's there for a reason, and, that, and we can give reasons for the existence of, the, of these things. Like that we need to set elevated objects upon this thing. That's why this is here. But we can also apply that why this is here to everything else in the cosmos. And then, and, and then what we're doing is sort of looking at the mind or the reasoning of this God who has organized everything in this way. So, so a lot of this stuff is, is, is repeating, you know, elements are related to bodies and so forth, but this is a sort of syllabus of, of topics that you learn in order to comprehend their physics. You go into greater detail and you also get to more and more complex entities. So after a more intensive discussion of God, then you have a, a rather esoteric discussion of this idea of limits, and then of place, void, time, and these entities that exist relative to bodies but aren't themselves bodies, and so they don't exist in the strict sense. Now there was another question, if there wasn't a follow-up. Do bodies, like, would God be considered a body in the, that sense? Well, <clears throat> no. God is the active principle organizing all of those bodies. Okay, but, yes? Is this organization actively occurring in the, in the present, or was, did it only occur at the generation? Yes, so it wasn't just set up and then, like, clockwork and push a button and now it's all going it's actually actively still being ordered and organized by a rational mind, okay? Um, and when I get on to discussing their theory of cosmic cycles, we'll look at some problems with that idea that there's a sort of continual rational governance of the cosmos, yeah? Can you give an example of a passive body, one that's ungenerated and indestructible? Well, um, the elements essentially play this role. Um, so they are, they are sort of, we can't, we can't keep dividing the elements up into, into 
prime matter or something. There's a theory about how the elements can be transformed into each other, and so there's a kind of transmutation of elements, and then there's a the recombination of elements in ways that give rise to more and more complex uh, structures that create greater complexity of bodies. But I, at one end of the scale is the simplicity of the elements, at the other end is the complexity of something like um, an ape or a human being or the space shuttle or something like that. That's very complex arrangement of different material parts. Um, Go ahead. Follow up question. Um, what about phenomena that don't have bodies but are more like forces like, say, gravity? Would that be considered a body or like a limit of nature? Well, that, that is where they get into, that is exactly where they get into the discussion of limits, um, place, void, time, and motion. How these bodies move, these bodies have natural ways of moving due to different qualities they have, like heaviness, lightness, um, dryness, wetness, things like that. Um, and so the elemental bodies have natural kinds of movements, but then different orders of complexity of organization introduce new principles about how they move and generally in accordance with, with ends and so forth that they have, and purposes that they play in this grand overarching cosmic scheme. So the ultimate account of motion is going to begin by specifying a reason why the thing is moving that way. Okay? Unlike, unlike a, say, an Epicurean view, where we explain motion by just saying material bodies have this inherent tendency to drop, to fall downwards, and then they must swerve every once in a while, but they also move as a result of their collisions, and we focus on, on the actual material interactions of the body, of, of these bodies, and sort of try to build things from the ground up out of them. Um, the Stoic tendency is to explain the thing by looking at the ends and the purposes uh, that it serves, and then looking at how the matter has been organized in such a way to make those ends possible. So um, a human being is a very complex um, entity and it has the, uh, and it's a body like everything else, but it has a body of a certain shape like um, standing upright and having hands and having eyes and so forth in order to bring about certain ends. Ultimately, happiness, but also reasoning rationality, emotional control, things like that. Yeah? Um, in the book I read for the report, he claimed that God was equivalent to like nature. And they were yeah, like, which book? Uh, it was the Stoicism and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Okay. Um, that, that was his claim. He said like Seneca argued for that, like the sage was one who was one with nature. Yeah. Um, and they were like kind of pantheists. And he said that like Spinoza was like a neo-Stoic. Is that similar reason? That, that's a nice notion. We have a PhD student working on Spinoza, re, re, trying to write up a thesis about his about Stoic influences on him. So I'm I'm happy to hear about that. Um, and the there are actually two senses of nature: a, a specific use of the term nature, and then a general use of the term nature. And in the most general sense, it is identified. Nature is identified with reason, the cosmos, God, fate. Zeus, uh, etc. Um, but there is a specific sense that I will get to um, in a moment in which um, in, in which nature really describes the kind of growth, reproduction, use of nutrition that applies to a plant. And that plant-like things have natures, and animals are plant-like things in a certain respect, and so are uh, humans, and by virtue of that fact, they have natures, but they also have levels of cosmic organization that go beyond just natural organization. Okay, but the idea about living in accordance with nature, which is the absolute key ethical principle of the system, that next, next time we meet on Wednesday, we'll really be trying to unpack what they mean by living in accordance with nature. Now, living in accordance with nature in Greek would be living in accordance with physis, so having a comprehension of the physical world, the natural world, how it's ordered and why it's organized this way, and then living in accordance with it. 
Okay, so that's certainly one meaning, is grasping what actually is going on, like that the Earth isn't flat, and that there is global warming, and things like that, and then acting in accordance with those facts about what's happening uh, in, in nature. Okay, uh, so a little bit more about the cosmos again, and you'll start to be annoyed by this, and then that'll, then you'll really be grasping Stoicism, how they make these identity statements. The cosmos, one sense of it just is God or Zeus. Another sense of the term cosmos is the organized system of stars, sun, moon, planets, earth, etc. That's the way we usually think of the term being used. Um, but then another sense is the combination of one and two, which they describe as a complex of gods and humans and things that come to be for their sake. And so notice that in that description of the cosmos, and that should say human, not men. That's my typographical uh, mistake. Somebody in here is working on... Stoics on gender and sexuality. Who is that? Okay, so, as you know, they would be talking about humans there, not men. Um, cosmos is a complex of gods and humans and things that come to be for their sake, i.e. everything else, okay? All other plants, animals, inanimate bodies, um, and so on. So, Contained in that definition of cosmos is a statement of what we call anthropocentrism. That is, making human beings the center of the cosmos, and in a way they literally are in their cosmographic diagram, but center of value in the cosmos. So another way to put it would be the end of everything. Everything else exists for the sake of human beings. That's the thesis of anthropocentrism. And the Stoics are anthropocentric, so they think that plants, animals, these other things, all exist for our sake. Now, to my mind, it's a preposterous notion, but on the other hand, everybody acts as if it's true. Right? Our entire society is set up as if everything in, in the cosmos exists for our sake. We freely use it however we want. We don't even really have many standards about how we use animals. We just use them for our own sake. And the Stoics would say that's exactly how the whole cosmos is set up to be like that. So our, our practice is justified if Stoicism is true. Um, now, just about their... Uh, cosmographic diagram, you've got a spherical geocentric plenum. That means Earth is at the center of the solar system. The sun and the moon and the other planets and the fixed stars go around the Earth. Everything in this plenum is full, so there is no interstitial void. There is no void within the plenum. It's completely, plenum means a full thing. It's full of bodies in, in, in the most elementary sense, full of earth, air, water, and fire, but then these are arranged into, into complex um, entities. And so there's no void within this system, but there is an infinite void in all directions outside of it, an extra mundial void. Okay, so unlike the Epicureans who say that void exists interspersed with atoms and there's a continuous alteration throughout the infinite cosmos in all directions of bodies and void, for the Stoics, there's a limited set of bodies in a spherical cosmos situated within an infinite void in all directions. Now, um, there's been a really fascinating discovery and development of a 2nd century BC analog computer that's composed out of 30 gears, and it was found in a shipwreck off the Greek island of Antikythera in 1901. And throughout the 20th century, scholars and engineers and scientists worked to reconstruct this thing, figure out what its purposes were, and actually build models of it that still work. And they figured out that it's capable of computing the astronomical positions of the sun, moon, stars, eclipses, and coordinating these with the 
um, cycles of Olympic Games, and you could do it decades in advance, and you could run the mechanism forward or um, backwards. Um, this is the oldest analog computer that we know about. Um, and the, the, the leading theory about who developed it right now is that it was designed by a Stoic scientist, somebody probably influenced by Posidonius. And this is because we have reports of Cicero describing visiting Posidonius' school in Rhodes and describing seeing these um, planetary spherical objects that do these kind of calculations, and also other evidence and other artifacts on the shipwreck come from the island of Rhodes, uh, even though it's at the other end of the Mediterranean from Rhodes. Uh, so that's an interesting thing, and, and it's built on principles of the Stoic system, and it's built on rational mathematical principles. So they came up with a model, a craftsman-like model of how you could replicate the motions of these heavenly bodies, and it sort of justifies their theory that it is rationally organized, because it's rationally organized if you can um, give a reason why it's all ordered in a certain way, and you can actually, it's the kind of thing that a craftsman could know and explain to uh, others. And so they, they, they built this, you know, not so they could like send email and do Instagram and that sort of thing, but so that they could have a model of a rational cosmos. And I, I think they, our, our, our internet is a model of an irrational, like out of control, anti-stoic cosmos. Okay, now uh, this gets back to the question about um, the question about nature, which I'll move through rather quickly because we haven't said anything about Stoic logic yet. But again, the cosmos is sort of administered by this mind, God, or reason, and this pervades it completely. But it pervades some things in the cosmos more so than others. And so it pervades inanimate things like crystals and minerals and metals and that sort of thing in the sense that those bodies hold together and have the qualities they do by virtue of what the Stoics call their hexis. Plants exhibit a different order of complexity of being. They not only have a hexis, but also their growth, use of nutrition, ability to reproduce, um, gives them what the Stoics call a nature, or a physis. Um, animals show even greater complexity. They also have a nature like plants do, and a hexis like inanimate things do, but they are capable of um, sensation and moving themselves around in space, which plants aren't able to do, and so we say that they have a psyche, or a soul. Um, and then finally we say that humans also have a psyche or a soul as animals do, and in a sense we are animals, and of course we have a nature just like plants do, and we have a hexis like these other inanimate objects do, but we also have this rational, leading, controlling part of our mind which is able to use language in which they call the um, hegemon. Um, now, I've already, I think, said enough about God, bodies, nature, and so forth, and we can, um, you can go back and review the slides if you want some more details on those. Say a little bit about their view about fate, because it's very controversial. Everything happens by fate, according to them. Fate just means what is caused, and everything is caused. Nothing doesn't have a cause. So since everything has a cause, and fate is just the conjunction of all causes, everything is fated. And so they actually hold that prophecy and divination, or if you want a contemporary term, prediction, and so forth, um, is real, since providence exists, and since causes are definite, and we can break everything down and figure out what its causes are, and then we can realize that if those causes are going to be in place again, we'll end up having the same effects. They also hold that every well-formed proposition, whether it's about the past, future, or present, is either true or false, and they exclude any middle option, or exclude the possibility of a contradiction being true. 
So what will happen in the future is already true, just as and it's just as fixed and certain as what happened in the past. Also, the cosmos has a definite rational plan and purpose, and so we can't be introducing uncaused events into that, or else we would be introducing unreason and irrationality into it. So the Stoics embrace a notion of fate, and what's challenging is that in their ethics, which we'll get to on Wednesday and later this week, they also put a huge premium on the idea of freedom and free human action. So how can they have an idea about free ethical human action while at the same time holding that everything is fated? That is an enormous uh, problem for the Stoics. Excuse me. Yeah. Fate here doesn't mean determinism. Doesn't mean that something. Yeah, it does. Yes, it does. Why do you say it doesn't? Because you said that it's rational causes. If it is yeah. rational causes. So rational causes are deterministic causes. So, because fate, when, 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 for example, I say it's my fate to, to die, it means that you know. There's a rational fate. cause for that, man. I know it's a rational <laughs> cause, but it doesn't mean when. So since it doesn't mean when, then it's not. What doesn't fate. mean when? In 50, 60, 70, 80. What What doesn't mean when? Let, let, let's say something else. So fate, in my opinion, I thought means something which has been already pre-planned. Doesn't mean like that. Well, yes, the, the entire cosmos has been pre-planned by a rational mind. It all has been pre-planned. Hmm. And, and, and future planned. And, and so... That, I mean, that, that, that's totally their view. So in that case, it means determinism. It means it's yes, determinism. determinism. Mm -hmm. Fully deterministic system. Nice. So their account of human freedom must be something that says human freedom is somehow compatible with determinism. Mm -hmm. And so they, they're compatibilists. They hold that freedom is compatible with determinism. In order to see how that is, we're going to have to learn something about their ethics. But as far as physics is concerned, this is their view, mm -hmm. and it seems like a pretty good view. Yeah, Which sense. part of it you want to disagree with, right? That some things don't have causes? That some propositions can be both true and false, or neither true and false? None of those are real good options for logic or physics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, it's... It's a difficult, controversial notion, but in order to see how they how they cope with the ethical part of it, we need to know something about their ethics. Yeah. Is there a is is there a hypothesized end to the cosmos since everything is pre-planned into the future? Well, end is ambiguous here. Between and some ends are purposes, okay? Like I have an end of getting lunch after this, so that means I'm going to go over to the cafeteria or whatever. Um, and end also means the last in a temporal sequence. So they think there is an end of the cosmos in both senses. Okay, so the cosmos periodically is consumed in a conflagration and completely destroyed and returned to a state of primeval or elemental matter, at which time it is then rationally reorganized by this God-fate mind, which brings the um, the cosmos into um, being again. Now, which cosmos does it bring into being? Well, this one, because it always brings a rational cosmos into being, and we're in a cosmos right now, and it's rationally organized, so this is the one that it brings about. And so they have a doctrine of eternal return. Um, depending on the kind of person you are, you'll either find this very... Um, reassuring or extremely existentially um, disappointing, but in their view, the entire cosmos will undergo these cycles of death and rebirth, like, eternally. So we will eventually all be sitting here talking about stoic physics with this slide on the board and everybody sitting in exactly these places and holding their pens or not holding their pens and having even or odd numbers of hairs on their head and so forth. All of that will be exactly the same. And it will happen not only again, but an infinite number of times in the future. Exactly like this. 
Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so he does think that like every every cycle will be exactly like the previous cycle. Like how in the second says, can the world cycles be differentiated? Yes. Can they be slightly right. different? Right. So if they are all literally identical, mm -hmm. as I just said, in every respect, and so whether you have an even or odd number of hairs on your head, whether that will be exactly the same in the next cycle. If every detail like that was exactly the same, then there might be a problem with saying that these cycles are different. In what sense are they different then? They're identical. And so there's only one cycle. Okay? Um, but, so Chrysippus' way of dealing with this is saying, actually there will be minor differences. So, the, but, but they won't make any difference to the rational ordering. So you may actually, now you have an even no, a number of hairs on your head. In the next one, you'll have an odd number. Okay? But that doesn't make, there is no causal influence of that to, to any, any other thing. Or, and make sure you notice this, when you get up, in this world, you might start on your left foot when you get out of the desk. But in the next one, you might start on the right foot. Okay? But there's no other... There's no other difference that has any, that, that, that makes any difference. Okay? So, but then there's lots of paradoxes about this. And one could do, do an entire research paper on their notion of eternal return and the conflagration uh, and so on. So, I've only got five minutes left, so I'm going to blow through logic uh, fairly quickly. And I'm going to really, here's, here's the divisions of Stoic logic, and I'm going to focus on this last part, their idea of a graspable presentation. Um, so what they hold is that we get these um, presentations. They're not just raw sensory data from the world. But notice, so you're not just seeing colors and shapes out here. You're actually seeing colors and shapes organized into people and tables and chairs and so forth. And so there's something more than just bare perception going on, or a sensation going on. There's a kind of perception that you're taking in. And this is a very complex phenomenon, this idea of what we're actually perceiving or what is presented to our sense organs. And they hold that among the things presented to our sense organs, um, some of these are what they call graspable. That is, we can learn the nature of reality from them. And they have a kind of theory about how we acquire knowledge. We start with a blank slate, like a newborn human. This human has various sensations and memories and starts getting more and more um, articulate perception instead of just sensation of the world. And then a plurality of these presentations are remembered for their similarities in kind, and that generates a kind of experience with phenomena. And then we get, out of these experiences, we eventually formulate conceptions about things. Um, and we can also gain conceptions by other people who have had more experience who teach them uh, to us. Now, a presentation is just basically an alteration of the soul, like some kind of change in the brain or the heart, whatever, wherever the center of cognition is, wherever the leading part of the soul, the hegemon, is. And the senses are joined to the outside world by these presentations, so they fall into our sense organs. And generally their view is that the presentations are reliable, and there are among them ones that are clear and distinct. And these are the ones that are graspable and on the basis of which we can actually produce um, knowledge. These are the ones, the ones that are graspable to which we assent with our minds. Assent is um, a power that we have, and it's totally voluntary. We give assent to presentations. We say, yes, this is really what's happening, or we say, no, that really isn't what's happening. Like, if we're viewing an object that's very far away, a tower, and it looks like it's circular, but we know that it's square, then we can actually make a kind of, we can not consent to the appearance that the sun is only a foot in diameter, or that that tower is actually uh, circular, and that's because we know on the basis of other uh, perceptions, like being close up to things or seeing how uh, objects appear smaller that are farther away, we can sort of correct these things. 
Um, and uh, there is the grant rule uh, presentations are necessary in order to produce knowledge of things, but we can get by in life with less than knowledge often, with just a kind of um, <clears throat> opinion that arises out of having reliable uh, presentations. Now, it's interesting because like the Stoics, they're also empiricists. So all knowledge has a basis in sensation and perception, and they are, like the Epicureans, very um, optimistic about how reliable these presentations and perceptions are. Uh, and this, thus, they, like the Epicureans, are very vulnerable to skeptical attacks on how um, sensibles and perception works.